Well, if I can invite you back to your chairs to make your way to your seats, that would be excellent. If you need a Bible to follow along with us this morning, there's Bibles over there to your right. You're welcome to get one. And you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12. Colossians is a, a familiar friend to many of us. It was our first book that we studied as a church together. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 and following is one of the most beautiful descriptions of the treatment that Christians are to have towards each other in the gospel community. As, as you know, we've been walking through this series on gospel community. What does it mean to be the church of God? The privilege, the value of it, the honor of it, the glory of it, the practice of it. What, what does that mean? It certainly doesn't just mean showing up on a Sunday. It doesn't mean just having your name on a membership roll somewhere. It, it means living life in a biblical pattern. In Colossians chapter 3, 12 and following is just this beautiful description of what a gospel community is like. Not just any community, not just a community of, of like-minded people people that like muscle cars or people that like guns or people that like hunting or fishing or certain kind of beauty product. This isn't just any kind of community. This is a gospel community, and it reflects that in very particular ways. So I'm going to read this whole passage this morning, um, but I'm really just going to look at one primary word. <laughs> one word, and we'll, we'll draw out how that word fits into the passage, but if you want a message on the entirety of this section of Scripture, I'd recommend um, Aaron Mayfield spoke on this. Uh, now it's going to be a year and a half ago, two years ago almost, um, so I'd recommend you can find that on our website uh, under the series Mark Colossians. I'm just going to be drawing out a particular attribute out of this passage this morning. So let, let's read the whole passage, and then we'll jump in. Colossians 3.12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now, our focus this morning is going to be on that final word in verse 12, one of the attributes that should flow out of our new identity, patience. Patience is a mark of gospel community. Being patient toward others reflects our gospel identity. So patience is our focus and topic this morning. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of participating with a group of people from our church, going down to an orphanage. I was in Mexico, a friend to our, our sister church there uh, in, in Juarez, Mexico, and we went down to an orphanage there. And when we showed up, uh, basically the same time that we arrived, I think the very same day or perhaps the day before, uh, they had received a, a new boy into the orphanage. And his name was Alan. Alan had had a horrendous background incredibly difficult, very, very challenging. And that was obvious in how Alan treated other people. He had had apparently virtually uh, no training in, in manners or very little training in social interaction. And when uh, Alan was around other people, he would spit on them. He couldn't speak very well, probably because of his circumstances. And yet, out of the jumbled words that he would kind of throw at people, the words that were discernible uh, were curse words, several of them. This is a, a young boy, seven or eight years old. Um, he had little or no um, just functional training, uh, so he would uh, wet himself while on the laps of people. And if you were going to take hold of, of Alan, you were going to take whatever he had done to himself onto yourself. And you were going to face 
his anger, his rage, even gestures of kindness towards him would be met with uh, just disgust. And this was this little boy. It was amazing to me over the course of the week how one particular individual in the orphanage was even over a few days able to begin to change this little boy's disposition. By the end of the week, he would call out to this individual the name Daddy, even though he was not his daddy, and slowly you could see the seeds of him beginning to change. Now what did Alan need? What did Alan need? What was required to care for Alan? It, more than just love, now love was ultimately what was needed, but it wasn't just a moment of love. It wasn't just a, a moment of compassion. It wasn't just one moment of dropping to your knee and taking him and all that he was into yourself. It wasn't just a moment. That was going to be uh, insufficient. That was not going to get the job done. There was, there was way too much need, and the expressions of love that were met with rage or disgust or disapproval, it, it, it revealed something that was going to be uh, uh, different, longer, what Alan needed was patience. One way you could describe patience is love over the long haul. That's what he needed. He needed patience. He needed long suffering. It was not going to be a quick return on this investment. It was not going to be a swift turnaround. Oh, incredible gratefulness. Thank you so much. And No, it was going to be messy. It was going to be painful. It was going to be gross on occasion. You were going to have to take on to yourself some of the, some of the filth that was present physically. That was going to have to get on you to love this little boy. Patience. Patience is a mark of gospel identity. It's a mark of gospel community. Patience marks the Christian. Patience takes love and extends it over a season of time and causes it to endure a series of insults and rebukes and burdens. Patience is, is love lingering over a difficult person. That's what patience is. It's a delightful mark of the Christian. And particularly so, because in that little boy, every Christian should see themselves. Every Christian should see themselves in all of their ugliness and sin and rage and rebellion and incommunicable infancy taken onto the lap of God and cared for over years and years of gradual, almost imperceptible development. And seeing ourselves in that boy, we're motivated to be patient towards others. Patience. Patience. I want to make three points this morning. The motive for patience, the mandate for patience, and the majesty of patience. The motive, the mandate, and the majesty. For the motive, I want to look up here at the beginning of verse 12. What's happening in Colossians is Paul is describing the character that is now our identity in Jesus Christ, who we are. He's been talking about who we are in Christ. And then he says we should live out that identity. He used this, this image of putting on, almost like you would put on a garment. Put on what is appropriate to your new identity in Christ. You have a, a uniform of behavior, he's saying, that is right given who you are in Jesus Christ, given what God has done done for you in Christ, you are now to, to walk out that new identity in particular ways. Put on, he says. That's the command. Put on. And then he lists out all of these different marks of gospel identity, compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness. And our focus this morning, patience, bearing with one another in love and goes on about forgiving each other and love which binds everything together. Patience is the put on of our gospel identity that we're focusing on here. But I want to focus on the motive that he inserts into verse 12. Notice there, he inserts a phrase that's a reminder again of why they should be patient. Put on then, listen, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved 
And then the list of things we should put on, ending with patience. Put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. The motive for patience and, and all of those attributes is our new identity in Jesus Christ. That's the motive for patience, that we are, he says, God's chosen ones. God has chosen you through no attribute of your own, through no loveliness of your own. God chose you. From eternity past, he chose you to belong to him. You belong to God. You are God's chosen one. Holy, that means set apart to be like God, to represent God on the earth. You have this holy calling. You've been chosen. If you're a Christian, you've been chosen holy. And I want to focus on the final word, in particular this morning, beloved. You are God's beloved, he says. Before he gets to what we should live like, he says, you are God's beloved. This is your identity. Let me remind you who you are. Put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. The recipient of the love of God. God loves you, Christian. You are his beloved. What a precious word. If you know your, your gospel scriptures, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know that's a word that God used specifically of Jesus. This is my beloved son, he said, at Jesus' baptism. And now Paul picks up that word and he says, that is now true of you, Christian. You are the beloved of God. God has set his affection on you. He has declared that he, he loves you with an everlasting love. That all of the, the evidence of God's love through the Old Testament scriptures, God's treatment of Israel through their rebellion, through their stubbornness, through their backsliding, revealed the steadfast love of God that never wavered, that never changed. It reached out to these people and said, I love you with a patient love that is long-suffering, that refuses to ultimately give you up. I love you. And Paul's reminding them, who are you? Put on as God's beloved ones. This is your identity. I think the implication here is that failures in character or sins like impatience or a lack of love, or love that expires over time. It's like identity theft. It's a little bit like sin, our old nature, takes over for that moment and acts out as though we are not the beloved of God. We act as though we are not who we are. We act out of an identity theft, a false identity rather than our new identity as God's beloved children. All sin is really just a, a mad scramble for worth and value. That's really what sin is. I mean, if you go back to the garden, the original sin was Eve and Adam basically saying, I, I, I want to take God's place. Rather than being content as God's loved creatures, they wanted to be God. And so it's this mad scramble for worth and value. I, I must take for myself worth and value. I can't receive that from the Lord. I want to take it for myself. I get to decide for myself what is important. I have to defend my own time, my own priorities, my own cravings. I have to prove myself worthy of the obedience and submission of everyone around me. Thus, impatience. It's a false identity. It reveals that. And so one way to think about impatience is a warning or a reminder that we're, we're not remembering our true identity in Jesus as the loved of God. We're, we're going back to that time when we were grasping for value from those around us and from our own strength and power. Impatience is just a, a grasping for power and prestige and value from those around us. I need this world to conform to me because only through what I take and get do I have value. That's the old identity. That's what impatience does. I grab because I do not have. I demand because I have not received. That's the old identity. Richard Sibbs is a, a, a pastor from several hundred years ago, and I would 
highly, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. This is, uh, I'm not going to quote, I don't think this is a quote from this book. This is a different quote, I think. Uh, but this book is, it, his works in general, I would recommend to you, and a particular work uh, would motivate your patience. It's called The Bruised Read. If you want to write that down, buy it. You can find it on Amazon, I'm sure. The Bruised Read, an excellent work on the patience of God and what it motivates you to do is exercise patience towards others. So I wanted to quote him this morning and also recommend that book. So Richard Sibbs, this pastor, says this. Those that are at peace in their own consciences will be peaceable towards others. A busy, contentious, quarrelsome disposition argues, or we might say reveals, that it never felt peace from God. And though many men think it commendable to censure the infirmities of others, yet it argues their own weakness, for it is a sign of strength to bear with their weakness." Those that are at peace in their own consciences will be peaceable towards others. A busy, contentious, quarrelsome disposition argues that it never felt peace from God. This is exactly what Paul is guarding against here. The only way you're going to show meekness and humility and patience is if you are remembering who you are in Jesus. Because impatience is a forgetfulness of your beloved status and an attempt to gain security, gain peace, gain confidence, gain stature through how you relate to the world around you. That's impatience. I need to prove that I am better than others. I need to prove that I have control over my destiny. I need to prove that I can get what I want when I want it. Isn't that impatience? And so Paul says, your beloved... You have no need to prove anything but that you're the beloved. You have no need to take status for yourself. You have no need to prove your worth. You are in no rush to dominate anything or anyone because you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. The very name given the Son of God has been given to you. What a foolish, worthless thing impatience is, denying, as it does, the beloved status we've been given. Now, there's many, many places we could go to study the patient love of God. And I, I'm, not, I'm not getting to, we'll get here eventually how it's a privilege for us to reflect this love, but I just want us to, to soak in the reality of it. it, it, it there is a motive to this, that the motive of patience, but I, I don't mean the, the motive of reflecting the patience we've received. That'll be our third point. I, I want to get to the fact that we have received it. The fact that you've received it and the security that brings and how that frees you from the slavery of impatience. Impatience is, is slavery. You're forever chained to the weaknesses of others. person sins and they, they, they yank you around because you've attached your importance and prominence to them person is weak and they pull you forward because you've given other people in the world or I have the power to control the future to control your reactions rather than trusting the future to God because you're beloved of God listen to this amazing passage from the book of Hosea Hosea is all about the, the patient the incredibly merciful and patient love of God most of the book uh, references God as husband and his people as a wife that he's reaching out to an unfaithful bride. But, but later on in the book, it, it switches the metaphor and God is the father and he's reaching out to them as his child. Listen, listen to this passage. I, I won't comment lengthy on it, but I just want to read through it. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of 
kindness, with the bands of love. And I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent, bent down to them and fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king, because they have refused to return to me. The sword shall rage against their cities and consume the bars of their gates and devour them because of their own counsels. My people are bent on turning away from me. And though they call out to the Most High, he shall not raise them up at all. But listen to the heart. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I hand you over, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? city that was destroyed. How can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart recoils within me. My compassion grows warm and tender. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. Now, if you know the Old Testament scriptures, uh, that's basically a summation of them. God just patiently enduring century after century after century of stubborn, unwilling to yield people who refuse incredible demonstrations of mercy, who, who show themselves to be incredibly foolish, incredibly willful and fickle in their pursuit of idols, who forget God, who don't return to God, who do the most foolish, exasperating things. And God says, how can I give you up? That love that God has set his affection on you. You're Ephraim. I'm Ephraim. It's not flattering, but it's so comforting. It's so reassuring. Isn't it comforting? I mean, don't you see yourself? As many times as I called, they walked away. As many times as I reached out, they rebelled. As many times as I appealed, they stiffened their neck. That sounds like me. That sounds like me and all of my sin. And God says, I'll be patient towards you. My heart is warm towards you. It's not exasperated. It's not fed up. It's not frustrated. God never reaches a point where he says, I've had it with his children. No, he says, I love you. I care about you. I'll come back again. I'll call out again. And we have even greater assurance in the new covenant where we have this identity in Christ. And he says, I will reach out to these children. I will not let them go. I will be patient with you patient over years, decades, lifetimes, patient for the thousandth time, for the millionth time, patient to forgive for the millionth sin, patient to overlook the millionth subtle secretive rebellion. I will love again. What's the motive of patience? You're the beloved of God. What do we have to be impatient about? Nothing. Impatience is grabbing for worth and value through our circumstances. Patience is revealing that worth and value infinitely have been given to us in Jesus Christ. The motive of patience, our new identity in salvation. Secondly, the mandate of patience. The mandate of patience. Paul says that they are to put on. He, he reminds them who they are, but they are to put on. I, I just want to make a simple, a simple second point here. Patience is a command. <laughs> the most obvious thing I'll say all day. Patience is a command. It's, it's a command. It, it is not the optional extra package for the super mature Christian. Okay? That's not patient. Sometimes we think of patience that way. I, I think we have the basic package, things like don't kill people, don't run them over with your car, uh, no tagging of their houses, uh, basic, you know, no knifing. There's not going to be any basic violence in the church. 
and then we tend to think that's the basic package. And then for those who for some reason have this need to exceed, uh, there's over here, there's the extra package for extra mature Christians. And on that list is things like forgiveness and patience and mercy. But you can choose the basic package and it's great because you don't have to do those extra things and you can just avoid murder and a few other gross sins and you're good. This is the basic package and then you have the supreme package. But as long as you're okay with not getting extra crowns in heaven, you can go basic. That is completely unbiblical. Completely unbiblical. Wrong. That is totally wrong. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach. Uh, the first commandment is this. Don't kill your neighbor. All right? Don't kill your neighbor. First command, the fulfillment of the law, don't kill them. No, that's not what it says. The fulfillment of law is not merely avoiding negative interactions with your neighbor. The gospel community is not trying to avoid being a tyrant or a devil. Insufficient. That does not communicate gospel community. Rec centers have rules like that. If you punch somebody, we'll kick you out, okay? Don't punch the fellow basketball players. Don't drown anybody in the pool, all right? Don't kick someone playing racquetball. That's basic. That's not gospel community. That's just a civilized community. Gospel community is something more. Gospel community says, this is an extra package. This is the Christian package. Be patient. Exercise patience. Long suffering. Long suffering is what that word means. The mandate of patience is laid on every Christian's soul as one of their life's purpose. You could say it this way. What's one reason that you are a Christian? So that you can be patient. What's one purpose for your life? Patience. Love over the long haul. Enduring loyalty to an exasperating person. That's a calling that we've been given. One commentator that wrote on this word says this. This is P.T. O'Brien. He says, the word denotes that long-suffering which endures wrong and puts up with the exasperating of others rather than flying into a rage or desiring vengeance. I love that quote. It puts up with, it puts up with the exasperating, the exasperating of others, rather than flying into a rage or desiring vengeance. It endures wrong. Long-suffering, patience, it endures, it bears with, it deals with, it keeps going in spite of the exasperating behavior of others. That behavior that naturally would cause us to fly into a rage of exasperation, of self-righteousness, of vengeance, I will crush you because you are so annoying. That reaction uh, is the old self. Patience is a long-suffering. It continues in enduring love towards this exasperating person and their exasperating sins. And it's a command. It's a mandate. What that means is patience is neither effortless. It is not effortless. Don't be deceived by false teaching that says, as long as you believe that Jesus has saved you, the Christian life will be effortless. And if you're finding it requiring some effort just remember that you're saved and it won't take any effort anymore. That is unbiblical. The biblical pattern is remember that you're saved and that'll motivate you to go do the effort that's required to be what God's called you to be. It's not effortless, neither is it optional. Sometimes we as Christians, we think, well, if it requires effort, it must be optional. Well, if that was the case, then why would he have to command it? We're not surrounded by angels so that giving patience to them is easy for us. And we're not angels ourselves so that operating in patience is natural to us. No, quite the contrary. Uh, it requires effort. But because it requires effort, we also have to remember it's not optional. It's required and it requires effort. It's a choice we make. You choose to suffer long. 
and let's notice that word, to suffer long. You choose, <laughs> how un-American is this in our modern culture? You choose to suffer long with a person. We don't suffer long with anything. I mean, your dishwasher breaks. How long do you suffer long with a dishwasher? Not very long. I suffer short very well. You suffer short with the light bulb that's out. Or you suffer short with something that breaks. Or you might suffer short with a really bad clientele service that a certain store has. You suffer short with the person who doesn't bring your food out very long. You suffer short with the child who refuses to go to bed. I suffer short with the friend who continues to say those harsh, unkind things. I'll suffer short with them. But God's mandate is suffer long. Suffer long. Love for the long haul. It also means, since this is God's word and it's a command, the mandate of patience means, the fact that it's commanded means that patience is possible. It is possible to be patient. God does not command the impossible for Christians. Let me make a very important point here. We cannot save ourselves. Perfection is is impossible except for Jesus Jesus obedience is not impossible difficult certain to be imperfect yes but not impossible it is possible to be patient imperfectly but to grow and develop and express patience God is not declaring go and do the impossible He's saying, go do your best, which will be imperfect, to obey. The mandate of patience. Patience is possible, imperfectly, but possible for the Christian to exercise. So, since we believe it's required, it's not optional, and it is possible, let's take a couple minutes and diagnose impatience. Impatience. What is impatience? Let's, let's think about it as a church. What is impatience? What is it when we're impatient? Patience, let me give you a couple of examples that I can just pull out of my own life. Patience um, is not present often, and impatience it is present when we think someone is wasting our time. I think that's a major category of patience. You are wasting my time. Uh, so a perfect example of this in my own life, uh, a couple of years ago, I went through this lengthy an exasperating process of trying to get insurance because we'd moved here and the church was being planted and so we had to change health insurance and so forth and it it revealed quite significantly to me I am not a patient man I'm not a patient man I thought I was pretty patient and so I started this process and I realized yeah I'm not I'm not patient at all and most of the time, the impatience came out at this heart of basically this condescension. How can you not know the answer to this question? And I was angry. I mean, I wasn't angry, you know, the first time, but, you know, the 50th time, it, something broke, and I was angry. The facade of short patience was exposed and being able to suffer long was not present and I was angry and I was angry because there you are wasting my time I'm asking reasonable questions they should have reasonable answers and if you can't answer them your boss should be able to answer them and I got passed along from boss to boss to boss until I reached apparently the ceiling boss and he couldn't answer questions and I finally said you are wasting my time impatience Impatience. I, I wasn't just concerned for the well-being of their organization and their business practice. I was angry. I wasn't just observing things about how they could be more efficient. I was angry. There was a spiritual eye roll that was perpetual on these phone calls. You are wasting my time. Impatience believes that something we could be doing with our time is more important than expressing patience. 
Let me say that again. Impatience reveals something we could be doing with our time is more important than obeying God. It reveals something we could be doing with our time is more important than our gospel identity. Being patient is more important than whatever you would have been doing. It's more valuable than whatever you would have been doing. Whatever I would have been doing, whatever I would have liked to do with that extra time that they were wasting, the opportunity to be patient, especially in the exasperating temptation that was present, is more valuable and more important than whatever I would have been doing. The expression of patience reveals the identity of the gospel. It obeys God. It glorifies God. Patience is heavenly attributes being displayed on earth. That's far more important than whatever else I would have been doing. You're wasting my time. One diagnosis of impatience that believes our time is about something other than glorifying God. I think we can think people waste our time also when we've invested in them and they're not showing a return. I remember reading about this. There's a particular, uh, I think it's Chinese bamboo. And I remember reading about it. It says that this Chinese bamboo plant, the farmer has to uh, sow to it and, and care for it and irrigate, I assume, somehow water and, and just care for this plant over multiple years with zero sign of growth. This is how this, this plant grows. It's ground, it's in the ground. You gotta water, you gotta care for it, so everything, no growth at all. The next year, no growth at all. The next year, no growth at all. Until the fourth year, it grows 80 feet. And I thought, that is exactly what it's like caring for people sometimes. I, certainly it's like that caring for my children and I think for other Christians sometimes like that's true. I, I have given you more than enough teaching and training and service and benefit. You should be revealing some kind of fruit for all the labor I've given to you. How can it be after all that I've done, after all that I've poured out for you, that there is no growth. I'm looking at dirt still. How can this be? Do you know the gallons of effort I have poured over you and I'm still looking at dirt in your life? I mean, isn't that how we feel with Christians and children? You're wasting my time. You're wasting my very valuable leadership efforts in your life. You clearly don't appreciate them. I'm moving on. But sometimes patience towards people is required for the eventual work of God in them. I remember hearing a story also about a, a farmer. He was, I think, 80 years old, quite old, in a, in a, in a field, quite old. And, you know, if there's any 80 years old here, I don't mean that you're old. I just mean he, it, was, it was older in his life. <laughs> and he, he was saved. Uh, he, he, he was saved. And he was saved remembering a Bible lesson that his Sunday school teacher had taught him as a child at some great period of age. He remembered all the way back. I thought, what, what was it like for that Sunday school teacher? I mean, that's even worse than the bamboo farmer. What was it like for him? I mean, I teach, and I teach, and I teach, and I give examples, and I try to tell you what it's like, and I tell you more, and I tell you more, and then I died, and nothing happened my whole life. I died not seeing any fruit from your life. Decades, a lifetime later, up it sprouts. Patience means trusting the fruit bearing of our time to the Lord. There's another category of impatience. Another category, you're not loving me in return. I think I'm impatient 
many times because you're not loving me in return. I love you. You don't love me in return. Therefore, I'm impatient with you. I've loved you enough. You don't love me in return. I've been kind. You haven't been kind back. I've been hospitable. You haven't been hospitable back. I've spoken grace. You've spoken sarcasm. I, I've done these things, and you're not kind in return. Therefore, I'm impatient with you. How can it be that I'm not receiving back from you, not, not just the observation, but I'm not personally receiving from you any benefit as of yet? I'm impatient from you. Patience is a declaration that suffering long with a sinner is living out my life in Christ who has given me all the love I need so that I don't need you to love me in return. Third category of impatience. You're disrupting my life and plans. I have more important things to do than love you. You're disrupting my life and plans. I was convicted of impatience this morning. My children got up early. This is the morning I had to be prepared for a message on patience. <laughs> and there is impatience there. You're disrupting my life and plans. Or we get cut off on the road. You're disrupting my life and plans. Or the business that we're working with makes a mistake. You're disrupting my life and plans. Or they make our coffee wrong. You're disrupting my life and plans. Or the, the spouse wants to argue at 11.57 at night. You're disrupting my life and plans. Or the friend refuses to reach out to us again. And we were really looking forward to that time with them. You're disrupting my life and plans. <laughs> Except that Paul says in Philippians that Christ is our life. And he says in Colossians, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Patience reveals that our life is found not in our plans, but in our Savior. Not in our temporary desires, but our eternal home. Patience reveals that our life is found not in our plans, but in our Savior. If you want to reveal that Jesus is your life, be patient when someone disrupts your plans. And be very clear, it's only when your plans are disrupted that you can reveal that your life is not in your plans. Isn't that true? There's only one way to prove that our life is not found in our plans, it's when our plans are disrupted. If we always get to do exactly what our plans intended us to do, then how can we discern whether our life is actually found in those plans or found in Christ? Because we're getting everything we want anyway. And so what does Jesus do? He brings these exasperating people into our life and he causes them to stand in the path of our plans so that our plans cannot be fulfilled, our life cannot be as comfortable as we wanted, we can't get what we want, so that a much more valuable thing can be declared, that our life is found in Him and our plans are ultimately about Him rather than in our plans, whether they be temporary plans about making it somewhere on time or permanent plans about achieving a certain status. When your plans are interrupted, rejoice. It's a chance to declare your life is found in Christ. You can't have that moment of worship any other way. Patience is a celebration of our life in Christ. The mandate of patience is a command that we should rejoice in. It's a command from God. It, it's as though God says, Go and reveal that you are the richest person in the world. Go and reveal that you're saved. Go and reveal that you have an inheritance in heaven. Go and reveal that the king of the universe is your savior. Go and reveal that. Or translated, go be patient. What a command. What a privilege. And what a privilege to do this in the church, in care group, when somebody shares again, and you've been waiting for 37 minutes, and they've gotten to share 14 times. Or when that person answers your vulnerable moment 
with a self-confident declaration that if you would just do this, your life would be easier? There's a moment for patience. Or when that person uh, forgets again to call you when they say they would or doesn't show up to the meeting when you made a sacrifice to be there, or when you heard about that person was served in this way, but I was not served, and why hasn't someone taken care for me? Oh, patience is required then. Or what about when somebody's kid does something wrong to your kid? And it's hard, and it's suffering. Gospel community is suffering long. It's the mandate of suffering long. Finally, the majesty of patience. I'll end with this. The majesty of the majesty of patience, the majesty of it, is that we are reflecting towards others what we have received. The motive of patience that Paul references here is that you've been given everything you need. So don't give in to the slavery of impatience. Live out your identity. The mandate of patience is do it. Obey. You must obey. You must be patient. You must suffer long. You must. You must. You're a Christian. You must. The majesty of patience is that in suffering long, you are reflecting the God who suffers long with his people. You're being like Jesus. You're not saving them like Jesus, but in your own small horizontal way, you're reflecting Jesus towards them. H how, how do we think it is that God displays his ongoing character toward us? Have you ever thought about that? We believe God is patient towards us, and he is supernaturally in culture, and he, he ordains traffic and, and caring for our health in these, in these sovereign ways. Yes, he does. But, but there is another major channel, major way. There is a face for God's character towards Christians. It's other Christians. H how does God reveal his patience to his people? Uh, directly, yes, absolutely. Through his word, yes, absolutely. But there, there's another source where God reveals his patience. It's through his people. So you have the privilege of displaying a, a majestic patience. I have the privilege of doing that, of displaying a majestic patience, a king-like patience. Consider the long suffering of Jesus. How long did Jesus suffer to love us? How much weight did he bear? Paul follows up on the word patience there with this marvelous phrase, bearing with one another. It could mean enduring enduring with one another, bearing with one another, sticking with someone through the thick and through the thin, in sickness and in health. And Jesus would say, even to the cross. Even to the cross, bearing with sinners for Jesus meant bearing the cross. Bearing with sinners for Jesus meant suffering for sins because the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Bearing with sinners, enduring with them to the end, suffering long for me, for Jesus, meant reaching all the way to the point where he could say, it is finished. For Jesus, he had suffered long enough when he died. That was his definition of suffering long with sinners. And even when sinners were mocking him and abusing him and mistreating him, he calls out in this incredible patience, have mercy on them, for they do not know what they do. He suffers long with them. Think about his disciples. He suffers long with their arrogant questions and their self-confidence that he knew would ultimately be revealed and exposed in their denial and departure. He suffers long with them. He stuck with them. E even someone like Judas, whose only final purpose was to deny the Lord, Jesus suffers long with him, even knowing that it will bear no fruit but his own death on the cross. And he suffers long with Peter and all of his arrogance and brashness. He suffers long with John and his self-righteous condemnation of others. He suffers long with those who are competing in jealousy for spots in heaven. He suffers long with me. 
He suffers long. He's patient. He endures in love. He loves for the long haul. He continues and continues and continues to love. Consider that. Now consider the majesty of doing that towards someone else. It's a majestic calling to endure with others, to bear with others, like it says. To bear with them. Who do you struggle to bear with? Is it your husband, your wife? Is it a lazy person and bearing with their procrastination and sluggishness? Is it a sarcastic, condescending person and you're bearing with their pride? Is it a person who, who is just erratic in their friendship? They f- seem to forget about you for months at a time. You're bearing with that kind of laziness. Is it a person who's, who's cold and harsh or who seems always to want to talk about themselves or interested in themselves? Is it a person who sinned against you in the past and, and doesn't seem to appreciate the weight that they've caused? What, what's in your life right now? What, what does it look like in this church, especially, and in other relationships too, to bear with? Well, the main thing we have to remember, it's, it's a majestic calling to bear with, to endure with the exasperating reveals the gospel. To endure with the exasperating reveals the gospel. To endure with the easy is not wrong. But to endure with the exasperating reveals the gospel. It's majestic. It is a majestic calling. How much cause do we have to bear with others? Let me guarantee, I will sin against you. My family will. My children will sin against your children. And sometimes we won't even be aware of it. So you won't have the pleasure of a heartfelt apology because it's blind offensiveness. You'll sin against each other. Sooner or later, somebody is going to overlook you or be selfish or slander you in some way or be unkind. It is absolutely guaranteed to happen. When it happens, let me just send this. That's not a prophecy, okay? That's not like impressive prophetic insight into the future. No, 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 no. This is guaranteed, okay? Because we're sinners. This is guaranteed to happen. Let's send this truth into that future moment. Let's send it ahead. Uh, Let's let's send it ahead, send it forward, tuck it away. When the moment comes that exasperation is your natural response, let's consider we're called to reflect the patience we have received. We're called to live out our identity as the beloved. We're called to reveal the majestic nature of a gospel-inspired, patient heart. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us all that we need. And as a church, Lord, we denounce the lie of impatience. Lord, the lie of impatience. We just denounce it corporately as a church. Lord, it's a lie. It's a lie that our time is more valuable than obeying you. It's a lie that we have better things to do than reflecting your character. That's a lie, Lord. We don't believe that. And we receive the truth, the good news, that patience reveals your love, filling our hearts. But I pray for everyone who right now has a relationship that they are very tempted to be impatient towards. And I pray that you would give them grace to exercise patience, long-suffering, enduring love. 
Give grace for that to be the case. In Jesus' name, amen.